Hello Year 11, it's Miss Michaels and I am going to walk you through the poem Mammoth's Wood by Owen Shears. So firstly, let's establish some of the context. Um, Mammoth's Wood is an actual place and it was the scene of some really fierce fighting during the Battle of the Somme. Um, the Battle of the Somme was one of the deadliest battles of the First World War and it lasted nearly five months from July to November 1916 and over a million soldiers lost their lives. Um, as part of the battle, Allied forces planned to reclaim Mammoth's Wood, an area of dense woodland that had been captured by the Germans. And this task was given to the 38th Welsh Division. The attack was poorly planned and many soldiers were machine gunned down before even reaching the wood. This campaign eventually succeeded, but over 1,000 Welsh soldiers were killed in action and nearly 3,000 were wounded. Shears wrote the poem after visiting the Somme battlefield in the early 2000s. So the poem was written in 2005. Um, and while he was there, they uncovered a shallow grave of around 20 Allied soldiers and that influenced him to write the poem. Okay, so before we begin, if you do have your copy of the anthology with you, um, it would be a good idea to open it to page 20 so that you can follow along with the poem as I read it to you now. And we'll then go on to look at it in a little bit more detail. So, <clears throat> For years afterwards, the farmers found them, the wasted young, turning up under their plough blades as they tended the land back into itself. A chit of bone, the china plate of a shoulder blade, the relic of a finger, the blown and broken bird's egg of a skull. All mimicked now in flint, breaking blue and white across the field, where they were told to walk, not run, towards the wood and its nesting machine guns. And now even the earth stands sentinel, reaching back into itself for reminders of what happened, like a wound working foreign body to the surface of the skin. This morning, 20 men buried in one long grave, a broken mosaic of bone linked arm in arm, their skeletons paused mid-dance mid macabre in boots that outlasted them. Their socketed heads tilted back at an angle and their jaws, those that have them, dropped open. As if the notes they had sung have only now, with this unearthing, slipped from their absent tongues. Okay, so now I'm going to look at some of the key quotations of the poem and think about you know, potential suggestions and inferences that you could make when exploring this poem. So for the first stanza, um, I mean, the focus is really the farmers digging up bones and pieces of bones, you know, years and years after the battle had taken place. So, I mean, it starts off here for, for years afterwards, she is, is clearly highlighting the long lasting effects of war in this first line. You know, he was influenced to write the poem because he witnessed the recent discovery of a shallow of a shallow grave of soldiers. And, you know, I mean, that, that was in the early 2000s. This war took place between 1914 and 1918. So you can, you know, it's, it's quite clear how how long after these men were still or the remains of these men rather were still being found. Um, we then look to this, this short phrase, this noun phrase, wasted young. Um, I mean, this noun phrase clearly emphasises these soldiers had their whole lives to live. but They were cut short, you know, due to the unforgiving nature of war. It just seems as though it's, you know, it's clearly very wrong. And it's such a shame that actually these young men had to lose their lives um, in such a really brutal manner essentially. Um, moving on to the second stanza, here Owens is describing the kinds of you know things that the, the farmers were finding, you know, for example, a chit of bone, 
a shoulder blade, a relic of a finger. Um, here, this broken bird's egg of a skull, you know, this metaphor really highlights the fragility of life and the human body. You know, these men didn't exactly stand a chance against the guns and the bombs that were, you know, facing them. In the third stanza, all mimicked now in flint, breaking blue and white across the fields. So we've got, they were told to walk, not run, um, <clears throat> towards the woods and it's nesting machine guns. So this idea of them walking, not running, um, and these mes mes nesting machine guns, sorry. Uh, I mean, these lines point towards, firstly, the plan to reclaim Mammoth's Wood, which obviously initially failed and killed thousands of soldiers. Um, because those nesting machine guns got them, basically, before the men even reached the wood. So it highlights the fact that, you know, these soldiers, they were easy targets. Um, and essentially, the soldiers were basically made to walk to their deaths. And so, it, you know, it seems to be quite unfair. It signals the injustice that these men suffered. Um even now, the earth stands sentinel. So this idea, this sentinel, sentinel means like a, a guard or, or a watchman. And so this personification of the earth as a watchman creates a very poignant image. It could highlight the idea that the earth watches the soldiers' unmarked graves. You know, the fact that there are bits of bone still being dug up or brought up as the land is being ploughed, you know, 85, 90 years later suggests that you know there were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers that died there and so it could be this idea that the earth is is watching over their um their remains it could also highlight that the earth um is you know kind of broken by what's happened the earth is is sad it's affected, you know, the effects are so long lasting that the earth is actually affected too. I mean, it says the next line here, we've got reaching back into itself. This metaphor is extended, you know, of, this, of the earth as the guard or the watchman. And it seems to serve as a reminder for the reader of the horrors that took place at Mammoth's Wood. So this morning, 20 men buried in one long grave. So firstly, the fact that it says this morning shows you, you know, how how recent it was that these discoveries were made. Um, 20 men, you know, the fact that they were all buried together illustrates the loss of identity that the soldiers suffered. You know, they were denied the right to a funeral um, and to be taken back to sort of their country of origin and they were all buried together in one long grave, um, a broken mosaic of bone, so linked arm in arm. I mean, this, there is a juxtaposition here because actually the fact that they were linked arm in arm does give the impression that these soldiers were buried with some care. And so it certainly shows the camaraderie of the soldiers battling in World War One if they took the time to bury these men together. Um, the broken, the fact that the bones are broken show the extent to which these men were physically injured and, and leaves the reader to imagine the injuries that, that might have killed them. And then this last line of this stanza is particularly dark. Um, their skeletons paused mid-dance macabre. I mean, it's a horrifying image of skeletons pausing in a dance. It, it creates a really sinister feeling. You know, macabre reinforces the grim atmosphere and suggests these woods are now almost a constant reminder of the death that haunts them. In boots that outlasted them, again, this links back to the first stanza and this idea of the wasted young, you know, boots don't tend, you know, a material object such as a boot doesn't tend to outlast a human. They wear after a few years. And so the fact that the boots outlast the soldiers' lives implies a sense of injustice, you know, it reinforces the youth of these men and that their lives were stolen from them. Um, and again, the, this gruesome image of of their skeletons of their remains is further developed here where we've got their socketed heads tilted back at an angle and then we've got this reference to the jaws those that have them dropped open I mean their jaws being just sort of 
hanging, you know, hanging open, creates this image of soldiers sort of dying in agony, almost screaming out for help. Um, you know, the reference that not all of the soldiers have jaws shows also how violent the war was because their bones were sort of all over the place, scattered all over the place, all over the place, um, which again is suggested in stanza two, where Shears talks of a chit of bone and the relic of a finger. There are parts of these men's bodies everywhere, um, of their remains. Um, in this final stanza, as if the notes they had sung have now have only now, with this unearthing, slipped from their absent tongues. So this idea of their absent tongues um, gives the impression that these men were forgotten about, and actually it's only now that their grave has been discovered that they can be remembered. Um, it certainly links back to the feeling of injustice, as their sacrifices were never really acknowledged. Although it, it does, in a sense, give you or give the reader this kind of celebratory feel at the end, because actually now they can finally celebrate the fact that, you know, they, they'll be remembered. And so that idea that they're, you know, the notes that they had sung of only now, this unearthing, you know, they're finally able to be remembered again. Looking at the form and the structure of the poem, I mean, it's written in three line stanzas, so pretty regular in that respect, um, predominantly in blank verse, although lines eight and nine, clo clo which close the first section um, with a rhyming couplet, and then lines 19 and 21 alternate rhyme endings. The length of the lines change and the longer length lines sort of break up the neat form of the poem, which could highlight the uneven ploughed field or even the sort of the chits of bone rising out of the ground. Um, the end stops show that there is a clear and regular structure within the poem. So the first stanza is end stopped and then it's followed by a pair of stanzas. And that third stanza is then end stopped again. Um, and then there's another single stanza, which is end stopped. And then it's followed by another pair where the sixth stanza is end stopped. And then that final seventh stanza almost acts as like a, a conclusion um, where the soldier's remains are, you know, are finally unearthed. So um, this structure certainly reflects the focus of the poem from the land and then to the bones and then to the people. And then this idea that, you know, the final stanza then combines these three elements into a single image of the forgotten soldiers that can now be remembered. So finally, which poem would I compare it with? Um, I've put down The Soldier or Dolce at Decoramist. I mean, obviously, in the exam, you'll only compare it to one poem. However, either of, the, either of these poems could work. So why? Um, the Soldier which could work because they're both poems about World War I. Um, Brooke glorifies war, whereas Shears highlights its long-lasting effects. So there's a clear contrast there. Both consider The Soldier's deaths. Um, Brooke focuses on the soldiers going to heaven, whereas Shears highlights their physical remains and how they were left and forgotten for years, which again paints a, a very interesting contrast um, to compare. Um, Dalke de Coramis is also a good one to compare with Mammoth's Wood. Uh, both of the poems explore the themes of war, conflict and death. Um, both of the poems are about the effects of World War One. Um, Dolce de Coramis was written during World War One, whereas, you know, actually physically he was, you know, he was there and witnessing it firsthand. Whereas Mammoth's Wood was written in 2005 by um, Shears and he hadn't actually physically experienced it. However, um, he had seen those graves being unearthed and so you know obviously that therefore influenced him to write it and so it explores the long lasting effects of war as the fragments of the soldiers remains were still being uncovered you know in the earth nearly a century afterwards and so there's a lot there that you could compare it with too um, and that is it for me thank you for listening bye